Beginning in verse 14, uh, if you were given a, a gift Bible on the way, and that's going to be on page 546, uh, verse 14 of Mark 6 reads as follows. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went, beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we gather around your word and we gather in song and worship, all of which you deserve. We pray that it was acceptable to you. We also pray that as an act of worship and that it would be equally acceptable to you the way we listen today. Let our listening be an act of worship. Let us throw our hearts open as an act of praise. Let our, our ears and our minds be attentive as a show of honor to you. For your word is alive and it's sharp and it cuts deep and it heals. And so we ask you now, come and let your word speak to us today from this very unique, interesting, fascinating passage of Scripture. Let us, let us see you, Jesus. Let us see you in the midst of all of this that we read, all of this humanity and brokenness. Let us get a glimpse of you that gives us hope and a hope eternal in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, in this passage that we read, you, you probably noticed a little bit of a difference. We've been in the book of Mark, and we've been going through and seeing the various, the, more than anything else, the acts of Jesus. Jesus going about healing and feeding and, 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 and raising the dead and casting out demons and Jesus being Jesus, just, just miraculous in all that he does. And then there's this interlude. There's this interesting kind of a, a parenthetical kind of a pause. And all this attention is now focused, it's, it would seem, on the surface elsewhere. Uh, up until now, we've been very clearly focused on the mighty acts of service done by King Jesus. Remember we said Jesus had come to be, yes, a king, but a different kind of king, of a different kind of a kingdom. He comes into the world of broken humanity to be a servant king, one who serves, something that in antiquity and, and even now just wasn't seen. That's not what kings do. When we look at this passage and we see that Jesus really, if, if, you, were, if you were attentive there, you, you notice that Jesus' name is only mentioned once in all the verses we read. 
But make no mistake that Mark pauses here, not, not merely to fill us in on some interesting history and biographical details. Um, Mark's painting for us a contrast, a picture, um, a circumstance that has everything, everything to do with Jesus. Jesus sits right at the center of this. This, this passage has its, vo- its focal point on, on Jesus. And so the other individuals mentioned in this passage, interesting as they are, grotesque and fascinating as they might be, they, they're, they're only there to serve the purpose of teaching us something. Real historical figures, this is, this is stuff that really happened, horrible as it is. But this is recorded in this gospel account to teach us some things to serve as examples of various responses to this one singular Jesus. It's one king and two very, very different responses that we're looking at here. One tragedy of blind and profane callousness against Jesus. And then on the other hand, another example that is an example of faithfulness and commitment and devotion to following Jesus and seeing his will done. So Mark takes a moment in this rapid-fire account of all these things that Jesus is doing so miraculously on behalf of a broken human race, serving them in so many ways. And then he gives us a vignette of these two very different responses to this one Jesus who came to save sinners. That's that's what we're going to look for as we go through this. And the two individuals to whom Mark clearly points us are, on the one hand, there's Herod Antipas, which we'll talk about in a moment. And on the other hand, there's John the Baptist. But again, what Mark's showing us and what we can't leave here missing is that these two individuals are brought up and the circumstances of their life and how their roads crossed are brought up to show us how these two individuals responded to this one singular individual that is Jesus. I believe that it's Mark's intention and my prayer here today among us that that looking at these two individuals, we put them side by side the way he did, it'll give us, I think, a combination of warning on the one hand and and joyful inspiration on the other in in our own individual responses to Jesus. Every single one of us, young, old, no matter what your background is, no matter what your pedigree or experience, we will all respond to Jesus. There are those who would say, no, I'm going to withhold judgment. That is a judgment. I'm going to delay. That too is a judgment. And so we're going to see these two men and I think see ourselves in one, maybe even both of them. Mark Chapter 6, verse 14 that we just read opens with the phrase, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Mark here is referring to the first individual when he talks about King Herod. You've probably heard of that name before. Actually, there are various individuals in Scripture who who have that, that surname. It's interesting that Mark would introduce him this way as King Herod because Herod Antipas, the one that's being referred to here, he was never actually a king. He wanted to be, make no mistake, he made every effort to be. He sought it with all he had. And and some scholars would say that Mark, in spite toward this Herod, he calls him King Herod in this passage as a kind of a sarcasm. That he would forever go down in the annals of Christianity as the wannabe king. And it was sarcastic. Others say that Mark was just saying this because it was just kind of the uh, assumed uh, reference among the people towards this man because he, he functioned in so many ways as a king, though he was just a tetrarch. He was, he was ruling a part of the region, but a king he was not. So this is Herod, and though he was not a king, and there's so many interesting things about him. He was definitely a man who carried uh, a powerful surname. He was, he was Herod. Specifically, this man was named Herod Antipas to set him apart from other powerful and 
putrid members of that family line of the Herods. And I think to give us a little bit of idea of who this Herod was, what kind of a family spawned this individual, I think we would do well to look at his family tree a little bit. This, this Herod Antipas that we're reading about here, he was the seventh son of his father, known as Herod the Great, whom you may be more familiar with than you think. He was a man who was known for a lot of uh, atrocities, a man who was known for his brutality. Antipas' father, this Herod the Great, he murdered Antipas' mother. So his father murdered his mother along with four of his brothers in various power plays and in fits of rage. It was just, it was not uncommon for family blood to run in the Herod home. That's just how it was. And we could go on and on about the grotesque behavior of this Herod the Great, his father, but but this man, the father of the Herod that we're reading about in Mark, is probably most famous for the account that we read in chapter 2 of Matthew. He's most widely known for what has uh, become famous as the massacre of the slaughter, the slaughter of the innocents or the massacre of the innocents. And that's when Herod, upon hearing from the wise men that perhaps a child prophesied child had been born who would rise up to be the king of the Jews in fear and in an effort to wipe out any possibility he sent out and he had all of the children in that region of a particular age wiped out. And in so doing, he thought he would wipe out any hope of Jesus Christ. Needless to say, that brutal edict goes down in history amongst one of the most heinous commands of a king. And he was far, far from successful in it. So that just gives you an idea of the stock that he comes from. This Herod that we're reading about comes from that kind of a family. That's the family norms. So Herod, this Herod, goes on to be a twisted, self serving, vainglorious wretch that killed and connived through his entire career as a tetrarch. It was just a constant series of power plays. It would have made a great miniseries. It, it, it was just, just one episode after the next. You go back and you go beyond the, the scriptural record and you read the writings of Josephus and you see that it was just an absolute torrent of ugliness just coming from this man's life. And his, his notorious career ended in shame and rejection because, remember, he was not a king but so wanted to be, so he kept on petitioning Rome that they'd make him a king. And he asked and he asked and he asked and apparently he asked one too many times and it bothered the emperor at the time, Caligula, who said, I'm done with you. Not only are you not going to be a king, but you're not going to be the Tetrarch anymore. And he bans him off to Gaul somewhere where he dies in obscurity, far from the grandeur that, that he wanted but. Before that banishment, and before the, that inglorious death, Mark tells us more about what this Herod had done. And so Mark first gives us the circumstances in which this chapter 6 of his gospel account finds, finds Herod. And then he lays out a little bit of history behind the scene, okay? It really is some masterful storytelling that Mark's doing here. He says, this is the time in the life of Jesus that we're in, and these are the characters that are at play, but so that you'll understand this one character, Herod, and this other character, John the Baptist, and how they interrelated, he uses a, a literary device called a flashback. You see it in movies. All of a sudden, things get blurry, and you're taken back to some other time, and it gives you some background of what's happening in the present. Well, Mark uses this and uses it masterfully. And in so doing, he describes Herod's darkness of heart and at the same time in telling the story, don't be so impressed as we read this, so marked by the ugliness of Herod's life that we, that we miss, that, that Mark is saying about Herod here, as, as, as we're not overtaken, over, we don't let the ugliness of, of Herod's life overshadow what Mark is saying about John. 
Because in the same story, he's, he's paying homage and honor to a man who was faithful, a faithful servant of the servant king. One that we should learn from. Verses 14 through 16. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he's Elijah. And others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, oh, no, it's John. John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. So there's all these theories. See, the words going out, Jesus and his 12. If, if you read the passage just before that, You'll notice how it says here, Herod heard of it. What is this it he's talking about? If you go before our passage, we began in verse 14. If you read verses 7 through 13, it's telling of how Jesus sent out his 12 in power and authority, and they went about doing all kinds of miracles, the same kind of miracles that Jesus had been doing. Now his 12 are out there doing. And Herod heard of it. That's what he heard of. The power of God at work through these 12. And, and it just amazes him. And the, the theories on the street are many. It's Elijah. It's one of the prophets. And he says, he comes to the conclusion right away. No, no, no. No, it's, it's John the Baptist. It's John the Baptist. He, 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 he could only imagine this one thing, having experienced the authority and the power that John the Baptist ministered in, how God used him. And then he hears that similar kind of authority is being preached in the streets. He says, I've only, I've only heard of that kind of authority in one other person, and it's John the Baptist. And, and he comes to this other conclusion. He came to the conclusion that his worst nightmare had come true that the voice that he thought he had silenced, he says he must be back. He's risen from the dead. And his conscience, still barely alive in that dark heart, is now filled with fear and paranoia. Now, he says there's only one way. John the Baptist has come back from the dead. Now, you and I know John the Baptist did not rise from the dead. But, what Herod wrongly believed about John the Baptist, he would come to see was very true about the Jesus that John the Baptist preached. He did not stay in the grave. His power could not be held behind a stone. And here begins this literary flashback. He says, it is John the Baptist who was risen from the dead, but then he says, it's the John that I had murdered. And Mark says, for the sake of the reader, Let's go back and tell you how all of that played out. And so the flashback begins here. And it's interesting because Mark spends a lot of time on this. This is Mark who, who has impressed us this far with being brief and concise and telling these short little stories about God's power is might, what Jesus was doing in the earth and what all of those miracles meant, how when he conquers death, he's pointing forward to an age where there will be no more death. When he conquers disease, he's pointing forward to a time where there will be no more disease. When he casts out demons, he's pointing to the fact that the kingdom that is broken into this broken race has come to conquer Satan and his minions and that how Satan's rule is rapidly coming to a close. And all of these things are done in this short, kind of concise way and now suddenly he spends all kinds of ink on John the Baptist so I think it, it deserves our attention Mark wants us to know and learn from, from the, yes, the sad lesson of Herod's response to truth and then like I said the example of John the Baptist but, but here with Herod Herod admitted murder in verse 16 I killed John the Baptist and then Mark goes to tell us why this all played out. Mark relates to us some of Herod's own profile. And it is, as we mentioned earlier, a profile that is deeply profane. And as we read through it, you can feel this increasing callousness. He had once responded, wrongly, but he had once responded to the words of John the Baptist. And we remember the words of John the Baptist were, were a heralding of, of, of a message of repentance because the king is coming. And it stirred Herod in some ways at the beginning that by the end and the last biblical mention of Herod, we don't see that response anymore. He didn't respond rightly at the beginning, but by the end, it is even worse. A callus begins to form on his heart, and we'll watch that happen here. 
In all fairness, the, the profanity of his life is immediately evidenced, but that callousness grows over time. And you see what I mean here. First, behold the profanity of this man, how profane he was. Herod as a political move, Mark tells us, and in order to marry into a royal bloodline, he marries a woman. First, it's a, he goes through an illegitimate divorce of the wife he had, somehow provokes the illegitimate divorce of a woman from his own brother, marries her, and by the way, she happens to be his own niece. Further, Mark goes on to relate how Herod, in an effort to relieve his own conviction, he throws John in prison because John knew one king only and respected none other so that he would preach to this Herod often and loudly. It is not right for you to have your brother's wife. And so Herod thought to silence him. While Herodias, that's his wife, his ill-gotten wife, his brother's wife, I think it's interesting how Mark never dignifies that union and he calls him your brother's wife. He calls her your brother's wife. It's like, it's like in scripture when you read about how when David ended up with Bathsheba, she's always known as the wife of Uriah. Our decisions don't have to be respected by God. And so Herodias, his new, ill-gotten, equally wicked wife, she just wanted to be done with John. She was calling for his head a long time ago. But there's this, this curious relationship that Herod had developed with John the Baptist. Verse 20 puts it, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. Furthermore, verse 20 tells us that Herod would take his now imprisoned preacher and he would occasionally call him out and hear him gladly. Hear him gladly. Hear him, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he beat one drum. He knew one song and he sang it only. Repent for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for there is one coming behind me who is greater than me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to untie. I baptize you with water into repentance, but he baptizes you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. Know the judgment is coming. Know that, know that he had one message. And every once in a while, Herod would call him out and just have him regale him with that same message. And then he'd put him back in the prison. He heard him gladly, but once he put him back, it says plainly that he was greatly perplexed by John. He found him fascinating. Now, now let's understand something. When it says he was greatly perplexed by John the Baptist, it's not because John was unclear. It's not because John preached in a confusing way. John had the simplest message in the world. It's the heart of every message that we preach. Repent and turn to Jesus for salvation. Be rescued from the coming judgment that we all deserve. That was his message. That wasn't the perplexing part. What was perplexing to Herod is, how am I going to deal with the feelings that this preaching gives me? How am I going to deal with the conviction that it gives me, with the hope that it promises? What am I supposed to do with this? The perplexing part is this. How am I going to respond favorably and salvifically to that and still hang on to my wretched lifestyle? That's the part I can't reconcile. I can't make that work together. And that's perplexing. And all of us have been there, I think. It's a perplexing thing to say. I want to serve Jesus and continue in this sin. I like this talk of heaven and a loving God, but I like to satisfy my flesh in these other ways. That's a perplexing thing. I like that Jesus calls me to forgiveness, but I don't want to forgive others. How do I make it work together and still have my cake and eat it too? And he was perplexed by him. And it wasn't because John was unclear. He had the one message. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife turn to Jesus. It really is an 
even more powerful message the more closely we look at what it is that John's telling Herod. He tells him, Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He's invoking law. He's speaking of law here, but he's speaking of law to a man who's not even a Jew. How does he have expectations that this is going to mean anything to a man who's not even a Jew? Leave that for you. Leave that for you guys. Those are the rules that y'all abide by. We're Romans. We live like we feel like it. But here is John preaching to him something that comes from the law. Why? Because what John is showing him is this. That the law is not just a set of rules for a group of ethnic people. The law reveals the moral nature of God and how God feels about marriage because marriage is a reflection of his relationship to his church. And so it doesn't matter what race you are. It is not right for you to play with this, he says. There's nothing perplexing about his message, but yet he says he was perplexed because he couldn't figure out how he was going to keep a pet prophet in a cage, keep a holy God happy, sermon after sermon. How am I going to make this work so that I can do this and still live a foul life without having my conscience bother me? That's a tough one, huh? Anybody ever go through a season of your life where you try to keep all those balls in the air? You don't have to raise your hand. Or... You might be right there right now. I love Jesus. It's not that, it's not that I don't hear it. It's not that the message is not touching me. It's not that I don't hear him calling me to a better way. It's not that, it's not that I don't hear the promises of hope. It's not that I, don't, I hear it, I hear it, but I'm just trying to figure out, I'm just perplexed. How can I have that and this? And it's perplexing because it's impossible. It's perplexing because there is no life in that. And so many would try this today. Gladly hearing the word of God. Isn't it interesting? He had a little private pet preacher. Pull him out when he wanted to hear him. Feel a little something, put him away. And we do that with the truth. Folks who go for years and years going to church, heard the gospel, I heard it. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah, I actually feel a little something. I got people tell me, I like going to church. I have no intention of changing, but I like going because I feel a little something. That's called a conscience, and it's about to die if you don't respond to it quickly. Because a callous builds... And soon repentance is hard to find. Some don't want to feel it. Some avoid it altogether. But there is a large number of people who, who like the, the tingle. Where, where, where are we with regards to this? I'm not just talking to the unsaved. I'm talking to me. Do you feel like you've arrived at some kind of an agreement with God where you can gladly hear His word? but yet go on living a different way. You can gain some points simply by hearing truth, though we have no intentions of being changed by truth. This is Herod. It's perplexing, and it's damning. Mark shows us how impossible and how desensitizing this approach is. When he heard John's call to repentance, and over time, gladly hearing it, his heart grew more and more callous. Verses 21 through 20, uh, 28, which we won't read, gives the truly lurid details of how Herod's half-hearted respect for God's word. Yeah, I like it. It's kind of entertaining. It makes me think sometimes. It not only left him unrepentant, but is leaving him numb and deaf to the truth. And what Mark calls an opportunity, an opportunity for Herodias' hate for John. Herod throws himself a great birthday party. What an egomaniac, huh? Throws himself a party. It's a lavish party, and he invites to this birthday party all of the great power brokers, the military commanders, and the great man of Galilee, the most powerful officials. And in one verse, verse 22, Mark tells us enough to know the atmosphere of these dark festivities as he tells us about Herodias' daughter, his ill-gotten wife slash niece slash sister-in-law has a daughter now. Now his illegitimate stepdaughter. 
and how this ill-gotten stepdaughter came in and danced for these men in such a way that it drives Herod to a drunken, lustful outburst of approval. Again, Mark calls this an opportunity for Herodias against John. She hated him. And this would let us know that she was behind her own daughter. It was an opportunity for Herodias, and her daughter is sent in to dance for these twisted men. What a mother, huh? It was no tap dance or anything so artistic. It was the sort of dance that her snake of a mother had no doubt, no doubt taught her about as a mean of manipulating men's baser desires and getting what she wanted. And Herod is moved in the worst way. And Herod offers her half of his kingdom. In case you don't know it, men get stupid in this state of mind. Now again, this was not in thanks for a wonderful dance. No, it was a down payment for future reciprocity. It was dark. And not wanting to waste the offer given by the drunken, aroused king, this young girl who Josephus tells, her her name, tells us that her name was Salome, she runs to her serpent of a mother and says, he's offering me anything. What do I ask for? Herodias' opportunity. It pays off. She advises her daughter to ask for the ultimate silence of that powerful preacher, the truth, the message that he preached. He, we've got to have him killed. Ask for the head of John the Baptist and to show you how that kind of depravity magnifies from one, gener one generation to the next. What the parents do in moderation, the children will do in excess. She says, I just want his head. And from the time she walks from her mother back to the drunken king and his cohorts, she, 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 she sweetens the deal. I want his head. And then she adds, right now. And then she adds, on a platter. Because she's already got in mind how she's going to proudly walk into her mother's presence with this grand, grotesque trophy. Look, mom, I'm foul just like you. Just like my new dad. And so that wretch, Herod, and with his pride piled upon his lust, couldn't go back on his word. It said he was, he was sorry about that because he remembered he had kind of, kind of held his pet preacher in the cage, but he kind of held him in favor. And now all of a sudden, man, now I got to kill my pet preacher. And I really got no way out of it because I made a promise and how would it look? And, and, and you know, these guys are all looking and, and it's just, and so his pride and his lust come together and he makes the order and the executioner goes and she comes back with the head and the daughter brings it back to the mother. But this wouldn't be the end of the story of Herod. As you know, we see Herod again just a few years later. Just a few years after this birthday party, we find Herod again. This time, he wouldn't deal with the preacher. He'd deal with the king that the preacher preached. Because in Luke 13, the Pharisees are now warning Jesus, and they're saying, hey, you know what? We understand that Herod would like to see you dead. And Jesus' response makes clear what he thinks and what he feels about this murderous pervert when he refers to him as a fox and tells them that he will not disrupt his earthly mission to go and talk to this wretch. I won't, I won't go and run from this wretch. I won't respond to this wretch. It's hard for us to, to understand the, the seriousness of this. Jesus' response makes clear when he calls him a fox. You, you go tell that fox, I don't have time for him. Now, fox is not, a, not, not anything near a compliment, all right? It's hard for us in our day and age and our culture to realize what, what a low blow this is. 
First of all, a fox was a dog, and dogs are amongst the filthy animals that the, jewels, that the Jews counted so, so very foul. And among the dogs, there is the fox, counted among the people of that day, just vermin, being this, this, this sneaky thing that would go in and spoil the vine, if you ever read Song of Solomon, and it would go in and it would steal the chickens, and it would nip at the heels of the sheep, and it was just this awful, lowly problem. It was scum, and he says, you tell the alleged king that this king counts him nothing more than a fox, and I have no time for him. Finally, we see Jesus brought before Herod on his way to the cross, and Luke 23 tells us that Herod finally had his opportunity to stand in the presence of the Jesus that John had preached to him so often, and his response showed how callous his heart had become, as Luke tells us, that all he wanted from Jesus, with all the darkness and brokenness of his background and his presence and his own decisions and his parents' decisions, with all the brokenness and the need that he had for a Savior, when he stood in the presence of a Savior, all he could think of was, I'd like to see him do some tricks for me. He's standing in front of Jesus. The only one that can clean that kind of blackness and heal that kind of brokenness. And all he can think of is tricks. Can you do some tricks for me? Can you show me a sign? And Jesus looked at the callous of his heart and his low intentions. And Jesus would not even acknowledge his existence. They were two feet away, but they might as well have been millions of light years apart. Can you imagine, can you imagine if when they brought Jesus bloodied and bruised and mocked and spat upon and they put him in front of Herod, if Herod had called to his remembrance all that John had faithfully preached to him and instead of standing there with that smugness about him, if he had just crumbled at the feet of Jesus, repented of his sin, declared him the true king, taken off his foil crown and said, all glory to you. Can you imagine? It would have been so right. Heal me, forgive me, wash me clean. I've defamed your name. I've hurt so many. He could have, he could have accepted that. For having despised and ignored the gospel for so long, a callous had built on his heart and standing in the presence of God in flesh, he could no longer find it in himself to repent. It happens. It's not to be toyed with. In that condition and in that moment so full of potential, Jesus would not even acknowledge his desire to see him do tricks. This is the greatest tragedy of all. This is the real horror in Herod's story. That's the scariest thing in all of his life. To be so close to Savior, to salvation, to pardon, to reconciliation with God, to hope for eternity, to be that close and not have it. And it's the terrible ending for all of those who just have a passing curiosity in Jesus, who hear and ignore the message of salvation, a call to holiness and right service, and we just hear it over and over and over again, and we're becoming inoculated to it if we're not careful, and, and it happens so subtly, we don't even notice it. When the sermon is for everyone else, and the voice of God is for someone else, a hardening sets in until... We just wouldn't respond if Jesus was himself standing before us. And friend, he will one day stand before us. That, that, though Jesus went from there to a cross, that was not the last time that Herod would stand in front of Jesus. He will, and we will all, stand before that same Jesus that he heard preached and that we heard preached, we will all stand before him for judgment or for reward. Which will it be? But amidst all of this, with not nearly as much detail, Mark is, like we said, also point, painting a, a portrait of, of John, John the Baptist. And it's not a picture like that of, her, of Herod. 
It's a picture of commitment to his Lord, to service to the king, to service toward a broken world that his king loves so much. It's a profile of faithful devotion to king and kingdom. John the Baptist, as we know, couldn't have a more different story, a different background. As we compare it, we juxtapose it against what we know about Herod. Some things you already know. John the Baptist was a fulfillment of prophecies from hundreds of years back. John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Isaiah's words and of Malachi's words, 700 and 400 years respectively, before he was even born. John was the fulfillment of a word brought by the angel Gabriel announcing his conception. He was born miraculously to aged parents. A Nazarite from his birth, he was dedicated to God, not just by his parents, but of his own will. He grew to love and to serve God and dedicated himself to God and living a life of holiness for the sake of God and for the sake of a mission that was given to him. And though he was the son of a priest, he lived with no luxury at all. He lived out in the wilderness and dressed in the humble attire and was cloaked in the same spirit of Elijah who had come before him. He lived out there and he preached out there and his message was so compelling that thousands of people would come. You'll recall that we couldn't read past the second verse of Mark chapter 1. When we started this whole journey through Mark, Chapter 1, you don't get to verse 2 before Mark is already talking about John the Baptist. An important part of, of, of redemptive history of God's plan is faithful followers, people who will hold to the mission of God, who will serve king and kingdom. They've always been part of God's plan. And from Mark chapter 1, verse 2, we're already talking about John the Baptist in his faithful service. John the preacher and the baptizer who was coming to prepare the way for Jesus who was coming on the scene. Telling people about a king and a kingdom that was, that was breaking into our fallen existence. And he was readying the world for them because the truth is, the world was not ready. Calling them to repentance. And so the way he does it is with a very clear message as we said. Repent. Repent and turn to the Lord. Repent because... The king who's coming is a holy, mighty king. And he brings a message of salvation whereby you can be saved if you receive it. And whereby you will be judged if you neglect it. So be ready. Don't miss the day of your visitation. When he comes, receive him wholeheartedly. While there is time, while there is life, receive him. His message was clear and his message was consistent. It did not waver. And he had every opportunity to waver. First of all, his message was in some occasions it was opposed. It was opposed by many. It was opposed by, by some powerful people. His message was opposed by Pharisees and scribes. It was opposed by the Roman government. But John knew. He knew, just like you and I know, that he was commissioned by a higher authority and that he could not be intimidated. He was not there as a popularity contest. He was not running for office. He had a mission to complete and a very short life to finish it in. He was opposed by many. And he handled opposition well. But he was so dedicated that he didn't just handle opposition well. He handled popularity well. Because there's another phase in his ministry where the people are coming in droves. And they're suspecting wonderful things of him. Maybe he's the Messiah. He had to build into his message a line all the time saying, I'm not him. I'm just pointing you to him. Maybe you are him, John. Maybe you are. Could you please be? No, that's not why I came. Can you imagine the, the, the human temptation when people want to call you the king of kings, the Lord of lords? And he says, no, no. That's as hard as facing opposition, facing popularity. But he's faithful to it. He's faithful to it in every phase of it. He wasn't swayed either way. He knew that his life and his ministry was not about him. Oh, we'd be blessed to grasp that. His words and his actions served as a precursor, as a foretaste, as a shadow of the king that was coming, he said, just behind him. 
John lived in faithful service to his God and in service to a broken humanity, just like Jesus, the servant king. And though John's great reward yet awaited him in heaven, in life, and in some of John's weakest moments in prison, Jesus spoke plainly of his pleasure, how pleased Jesus was with John's faithfulness. When he says in Matthew eleven eleven, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What a statement. I mean, first of all, when God takes on flesh and comes to earth and brags about you, you're doing something right. You're pleasing the king. When he comes and says, oh, of those born of women, there is not one that compares to this John. He, he scolds the people. He says, when you went out to see John, now that he's in prison, you're missing him. But when you went out to see him, really, what did you go to see? A man in soft clothing? Soft clothing belongs in palaces. No, this man didn't come to be in palaces. He came to help you arrive at a glorious and unending palace. He came and commissioned by God. And of those born of women, and which man was not born of women? So he's saying, of all men, there is no one greater than John the Baptist for his faithfulness, for his fulfilling of his life's purpose. But then he goes on to add this other qualifier. He says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He talks about how John was this transitionary guy. He is the last of the Old Testament prophets. And if everyone born up until that point, nobody was greater than him. But he came preaching the kingdom. And those who would be brought into the kingdom through Jesus and, and the gospel and coming in by grace, he says, the least in this kingdom is greater than John. Because they are not partakers of a new covenant that John was not a part of. They are not partakers of a grace that John only pointed forward to. So you and I, we may not be John the Baptist in all of the powerful works, but he says that in God's estimation, because you came in by the blood of Jesus, you are held as greater than John the Baptist. Oh, that we would live in that reality and in that joy, in that sense of privilege and awe. John's the greatest of all men. And you, the least of you, he says, are greater even than he. Do you realize what Jesus did when he brought you into the kingdom? Do you realize who he made you to be? I think that would have a lot to do with the way we live the life he's given us. John was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. We, we live in a new, a new covenant era, and John in his life and in his death, was clear. He was so clear about his mission, his very purpose for existing, not seeking approval or significance from people around him. He was just like his servant king. He knew where his approval was derived from. He knew where his significance came from. He knew where his identity was bound up. And he just lived the life God gave him to live and serve the people God called him to serve. And you know what? While John the Baptist's death did not purchase salvation for any of us, it too is a foreshadow of the death that his master, his king, would die. John was sent to prepare the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, rich and poor, people of every ethnic group. He was called, he was sent to call us all to receive Jesus. And the eternal life that he gives to all who would turn from sin, from self, and turn and trust him for forgiveness and life that is eternal and truly life. He was clear, he was so crystal clear that nothing dissuaded him, nothing diverted him, nothing detoured him. He was, he was clear. Are, are you and I this clear? Are, are we so secure in our salvation and in our reason for existing, our, our mission in life, in the message that we proclaim, in knowing what matters really, what really matters in life and in eternity? 
And knowing clearly without a shadow of a doubt, having it as a settled issue in our lives, who it is that really deserves our total devotion down to our last breath. Are we that clear? Is it clear in your heart? Is it clear? Is it, is, is it, is it, is it, a, is it a, a joint mission in your marriage? Is it, is it the battle cry of your home? Is it the banner that we wave as a local congregation? We know why we exist, for whose glory we live, whose message we proclaim, whose kingdom we are an outpost of. We are clear in all. Are we clear this way? This is what made John, John. And Mark puts him out in front of us. God's message, the gospel is clear. Jesus is worthy, absolutely, only, solely worthy of our trust and our every effort and every bit of suffering we might face. We don't need to be as Herod perplexed. It's complicated, pastor. I've got a lot going on. They told Jesus that. And he tells a whole crowd of people, all of them with their own set of circumstances, all legitimate circumstances, real pain, real issues. And he's not, he's not downplaying them. He's not belittling them. But he says to them, truly, 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 it's not that complicated. First, seek the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these other things, they will be added to you. Be clear Keep it simple. Why do you exist? Why are you married? Why is there a thump in your chest? Why did God trust you with children? Why did God set you in Yuma? Why did God put you on that street? Why did God put you in that cubicle, in that job? Why does God have you living in this generation? Be clear, be clear. It's not perplexing. And be about it. I want, I want a beautiful, faithful life like John's. I want all of us together to follow that example. I want us to be crystal clear in our commission and faithful in all circumstances. I want us to shudder at the thought of Herod's callousness and I want us to leap at the example of John's life devoted to the service of his king in favor of a broken world. Don't be perplexed. Don't be confused. It's not that confusing. It said that an artist once standing in front of a huge piece of granite took up his chisel and his hammer and he began to chisel away. And they said, what are you making? He says, I'm making an, I'm making an elephant. I'm going to sculpt a beautiful elephant. And they said, well, how do you do that? He says, well, I just I take a look at the stone and I take my, my mallet and I take my chisel and I just knock off everything that doesn't look like an elephant. Our lives, my life, my heart, my to-do list could use such sculpting. I want to be so clear. I want to be so clear in my mission, in my fulfilling of that mission, in this short vapor of a life that is mine. I want to be so clear that everyone around me is clear that I'm clear. I don't want to walk around perplexed, portraying a Jesus that is somehow perplexed. He's not perplexed. And you know, just before we feel that John's story is a tragedy because he dies, his story would seem to, to end here in such an ignominious and shameful way. He, he, he died at the end of an executioner's blade. We might say, well, that's, that's terrible. What, what a bummer for a, a faithful guy. I want us to see this as John saw this. That we cannot measure such a heavenly-minded man in such an earthly way, not even in his death. John knew who his king was, what his message was, what his mission was here, and he sought the satisfaction of a task finished. I've been in enough deathbeds to know what it looks like when people die with unfinished business. 
I've also had the beautiful experience of watching faithful saints leave this earth knowing that they fulfilled their purpose in their generation and go to sleep with their fathers and see their Lord. And though John didn't die in a bed surrounded by loved ones singing hymns and reading scriptures, he died with that same satisfaction. He said it himself. He knew the satisfaction. God let him taste that before he left because we know in John chapter 3, verse 30, as some of his disciples begin to go off and follow the Jesus that he pointed them to, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And his disciples who had followed him in preparation of the coming of that king, they said, is that him? That's him. And it makes no sense to follow you anymore, John. And John said, you're right. And then he says those words that I wish we would have engraven on the inside of our eyelids. But in Luke chapter 3, he says, I must decrease. He must increase. He says, I'm winding it down now. I said, he's coming. He told me to say it. He told me to say it when it's hard. He told me to say it when it's easy. He told me to say it all by myself. He told me to say it in great company, but he told me to say it and live my life saying it. And I did, and now he's come, and now I'm ready to go. And it doesn't matter how I go. And it doesn't matter if I'm alone in a jail cell. It doesn't matter if it comes, Lord, through the, through the means of some perverted plot out somewhere else. I know my mission's done, and I'm ready to go. Are you so ready? Am I headed to that kind of a satisfied last breath. I think that's why John puts these two in front of us. Excuse me, Mark puts these two in front of us, John and Herod. I think that's why Mark wants us to take a look at these two and how they responded to Jesus. And here is Mark saying in John's gospel, he must increase, but I must decrease Words that a calloused, self-centered Herod and all the Herods of this world and all the little Herods in our hearts that want to rise up, they could never, ever understand or confess. I must decrease. That's the opposite of what my heart tells me. That's the opposite of what the world around me tells me. That's the opposite of what they promised me at the department store and the gym and everywhere else. They're promising all these other things. No, 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 not decrease. Not de It's all in you. It's all in you. Just release it. And here is John saying, I want to live. Mark saying about John that he just lived his life to the end for the glory of his king. Knowing why that life was entrusted to him. He knew just as that blade was falling, Jesus was proclaimed, Jesus was believed, Jesus was served, Jesus has come on the scene. Salvation has come to the world. My purpose has been fulfilled. I'm done. I go to a better place. May our lives be lived and our deaths be died with such clarity. Following, serving, proclaiming our servant king, reflecting him in the way we live. So, if you saw more of yourself today in, in, in the tragically, increasingly calloused heart in the perplexity and the confusion of where am I going to cast my lot? Where am I going to dedicate myself? Is it going to be to, to, to the flesh and these other things? Or is it going to be to the king, immortal, eternal, invisible, the only wise God? If you find yourself in a perplexity that just looks so Herodian in its nature, before the callous sets in, before you don't hear the gospel clearly anymore. Do what Herod never did. Though he was so close. Believe. Trust. Repent. Surrender. Follow Jesus. Live and die in and for him. Uncomplicate life. What am I going to do? I'm going to do the things that will serve that purpose. 
What am I not going to do? The things that do not contribute to that purpose. Knock off everything that doesn't look like an elephant. May we all, and this is my prayer, and this is our labor together, and this is our, our project in faith, is that we together and in increasing numbers for the sake of his kingdom, that we would all follow the example of this great servant John. Because in the life and in the death of John, people saw the beauty of the life and the death and the resurrection of King Jesus. Let us not be perplexed. Let us be faithful. Jesus is worthy. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you, Father.